Hey, welcome to the last presentation in the statistics section of the Maths Applications course. And here we have it, the elementary as aspects of the normal distribution, whatever that means. I'm going to take you on an exciting journey. You're back here at histograms. We're going to go on and look at some special functions and then down here, and oh, there's a bit of maths there, don't worry. We're not actually going to hop into that maths too much at all in this course. You might like to try and draw the graph of this on your calculator and see if you get this very special curve, which is called a normal distribution curve. But more of that later on, come on down and let's go on a bit of a journey now. And the uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at changing the way we look at frequency tables. Remember what a frequency table is? You would have some scores and then the number of times or the frequency with which each score occurred. So you could make up a fraction, a relative frequency, a frequency as a fraction of the total number of items. Okay, item frequency over the total frequency. Let's do it. So here's the score and here are the frequencies. What fraction of the total occurred in for this score? Well, it'd be two out of 30, wouldn't it? Total of two and two thirtieths lie in that group. What about this one? Five thirtieths lie in that group. Four thirtieths in this group. So you see what I'm doing? So you can see all the fractions must add up to a whole. So two thirtieths plus five thirtieths plus four thirtieths must equal da, 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 one. So these are fractions of the total occurring in each group. Hey, do you remember your work with fractions and percentages? You could change this fraction, this decimal fraction, 0.2 to a percentage by timesing over 100, by, by multiplying by 100, which would be 0.2, so here it would be 20%. Okay, that's a pretty handy use of the relative frequency or the fractions within each group. So what we're going to practice for a start, because this is very important a bit later on, is can you change frequency to relative frequency and use that in your histogram rather than frequencies? Come on down and let's have a go. So uh, here's our histogram. What we're aiming to do is to change this frequency to a relative frequency. And I've just given you a very good reason why we might do that. Because then when we read off the height of the column, instead of there being 49 in there, we can say what fraction that was of the total and then get the percentage in that uh, group. That's a powerful tool, particularly if the totals for people's different histograms aren't out of the same. You know, let's say you do 200 and your mate does 300. How are the size of your columns? How can you compare them? So it's best to have a common height, and the best way of doing that is a relative frequency or even change it to the percentage up there. So it's easy to find out what percentage of the total are in each group. Do you get it? It's quite an important aspect for later on when you're working in maybe commercial areas particularly. Come on down now and let's have a look. Screen clippings here from Hayes and Harris Publications. So we'll just creep back up again a little bit here, slip that one down a bit. So here we are. Following data is the number of mint drops in a packet. Now this goes back to quality control. By this stage in the course, it's important that you realise that statistics is crucial in quality control. You can't measure all the whole population of packets of mint drops that you produce. So we're going to take a sample here. Okay, and so here's a list of the data we've got. We've measured a certain number of packets. What have we got there? Uh, 36, 7, 8, 9, 40. I think it's about 45 or something here. Okay, we'll have a look at that in a minute. Now what we're going to do is put it in a table form for a start because it's easier to manage the data if it's in a table form. So come down and let's just have a look at how we would do that then. So each time we see the 26, 
we put a tally and then 27, get them all tallied up, so we've got a frequency. Okay, and then we're going to make a relative frequency. Remember, this is a fraction. But let's have a look at how many we've got here. So down the bottom, there's only 40 here. So the 40, so this would be 1 40th, that's its fraction. 6 divided by 40. Remember, it's a number in the group divided by the total that we've uh, uh, measured there, the total number of data points. Okay, what percentage of the packets contained 30 mints? Let's go to 30. Here's 30. And it's the relative frequency point 075. So if I multiply that by 100, that'll be equal to 7.5%. Handy stuff, isn't it? And what about at least 30 mints? At least means all the groups from 30 upwards. So we will be adding all of those up. So let's do that and let's see what we've got here. When you add those, here we come from Hayes, Hayes and Harris. We have a total of 0 0.500. So multiply by 100. <coughs> Excuse me. Multiply by 100, you get 50%. And then, of course, you can do any numbers you want. Probably of exactly 31 mints. There it is there. Change it to a percentage. Here's 17.5 percent or at most 28 mints so that's everything up to 28 add them all up and you could change that to a percentage as well so and then the final answer if we're trying to estimate the number containing 30 mints out of 3600 packets so out of 3600 we want to know how many would contain exactly 30 mints it's the probability or the relative frequency in that group, which is 0.075 times 3600, 270 packets. Okay, so this is called extrapolation actually. You're taking a small sample in which you've got 0 0.075 and then you're extending or extrapolating it to a much larger number from the population. That may not be accurate, might it? Because we've only got a small sample if we took more, that uh, fraction within the group might be changed. It might be a better estimate if we took a larger sample. Now, are you ready to have a go and see what you can get out of a data set by doing this relative frequency calculation? There's just a few little problems here. I want you to go through them as that example is, so maybe look at it in the textbook from Hayes or rewind the video when you've made up your table. So there's all sorts of things you can say in analyzing, analyzing your data set by two, using this relative frequency and the idea of changing it to a percentage. All right, pause the presentation, have a go at that first question. I'll come back in a minute and show you the answers. Let's go on now to question two. Same idea. This time uh, the data here is grouped already. It's not discrete data, this is continuous data now. Now you do the same thing again, but this will be a histogram type a graph like we saw before if you were to graph it. Well, all we're doing is do dealing with a table and fractions of the total that occur in each group. That's called a relative frequency. All right, have a go at all of these. Get some skills happening here. Must do our lap running as if you're an athlete. You've got to keep training. All right, I'll go on to question three now. Here's question three. Samples of two week old seedlings, seedlings and measured their heights. We're getting a different distribution of heights here. They're all in groups. This is again continuous data. Continuous data, not discrete as it was in example one, I think. Let's just check example one. I think that was discrete, wasn't it? Yeah, here we are, lifetimes, probably all just in hours. So nothing between 100 and 101. If we assume that, we're measuring it as discrete data, only to the nearest hour. Okay, so here we are. Same sort of questions again. With the data, it's been grouped. Now if we can construct a frequency table, that's it there. Now a relative frequency table, 
and have a look at the proportions, there's another word, or fractions within each group, and then change them to percentages. Okay, let's have a look then. Here's a probability here, here, this is what we want. Find the probability the random chosen seedling was that. Okay, all right, come down, let's have a look at the answers now. There's question one, uh, up to part E there. Check your answers. Coming on, question two. Okay, did you get this diagram? Remember, there's no gaps between uh, the groups when you're using continuous data. It's a histogram. And cool, this is good, isn't it? Nearly 40% were between the 40 and 50 metre mark. So it's handy, isn't it? Let's go to question three. Uh, here's question three. Okay, and lots of information you can get from a relative frequency table or a relative frequency graph. Makes it easy to see the percentages of, of the data that are in particular sets. All right, are you excited? What's gonna happen now is very exciting. So come on down and let's have a look at what we said before. This was the opening window, but I've changed things a little bit from the opening window. Do you see the difference? I think these two are still the same, uh, but look at this. What would you say was very, 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 very special about this histogram? The data values would be continuous, and this is a histogram. What do you notice a little bit special about this compared to the blue one that I, we've seen before in this presentation? We'll discuss it. What do you think? It's the almost perfect symmetry about a mean position in the middle. Perfectly symmetrical. Equal chances of being on the high side and the low side. Okay. Now this occurs quite a bit in uh, the real world due to random variation. Random means equally likely to be higher or lower than the usual or normal mean in the middle there. And here we are, area below, come over here, area below the normal curve. What's this curve? Well, we're gonna say, if you did this data sampling, this is a lot of data here, if you kept going and got more and more, thousands, even millions of scores, you would find you would put them in smaller and smaller groups, you could put them in smaller and smaller groups and actually see that all the values in between might be included. You could have a continuous curve, not just in one group or another, but smoothing out so there are many scores of each individual value. Okay, and we would have, here we've got rectangles, have an infinite number of rectangles. So we could actually say the distribution for the whole population of such items, and they could be heights of people or something like that, there'd be many at each individual height, not just in groups, there'd be many at that height, many at the next one. Okay, so it would be a smooth curve, no gaps. And that's an interesting concept, isn't it? Where we take it from a sample set of data right out to uh, an infinitely sized population perhaps. Okay, and there aren't just groups. There are many people on every possible and conceivable score. Okay, well, let's go on. I think this, this little uh, graph here gives you some idea of uh, what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a smooth curve like that mathematically to, in answer to what we observe in nature quite frequently, quite frequently, the normal distribution. Let's go and have a look at it in more detail now. Okay, how the normal distribution arises. The normal distribution is really the distribution of scores so that they form a symmetrical, if you like, bell-shaped smooth curve like this, with no gaps between the rectangles and every individual possible point has a chance of occurring. Okay, now what about some examples? Here's some from Hayes. The birth weight of babies. The birth weight is, combi is a combined effect of a number of random, here it is, random factors. 
please remember the randomness is responsible for the symmetry of the normal distribution. Okay, in other words, you're equally likely to be above or below the common um, value, the modal value. And therefore, the mean, the median, and the mode will all be the same value. That's the special nature of this distribution. And how do you get that? Well, you have to have equal likelihood of being above or below. You have to have random factors operating. So, what are some of the random factors when you look at a whole population? Well, the genetic genes from both parents will vary. Some will be such that they result in a heavier birth weight of babies, some lighter. Mother's food intake, people vary in a random way. Um, like, you know, equally likely to pick a person who um, is eating one food or another. Okay, mothers exercise during pregnancy. Yep, some will be exercising a lot, some won't be. That will be varying randomly. And environmental factors, other factors that we can't actually see operating. You know, it could be such that um, somebody's very happy going on a holiday, some people are not, and there's other things that affect uh, birth weight and uh, things like that. So we're trying to identify the circumstances, and here's the key word, the random nature of those circumstances which are going to give rise to this symmetrical distribution. And by now, uh, I think you should be saying, hey, I'm getting sick of you, this, Huddy, talking about the symmetrical distribution. What's the point? Well, all right, you want to ask that question? I'm going to answer that. And here it is. If you plot the relative frequency or the probability of getting a score against the data values, this is called the normal distribution if you get this perfectly symmetrical uh, situation. And the reason why we're raving on about that is twofold. First of all, it occurs common, commonly in our world. Okay, natural variation, variation um, due to machine manufacture shows random and systematic errors. So you get this sym symmetrical distribution. And number two, if you find something that is varying like this, you can use mathematics to calculate the probability. Use maths to calculate the probability of getting any range of scores, okay, without actually sampling quite like we did before. I wonder if you've worked out how you can use maths. It has something to do with that little formula back there. I wondered if you realised that if you can draw the graph of that dude and it's a nice, simple, little, uh, easy, normal distribution, then we could adjust that to suit any probability. This, uh, this one, I think, is centred, isn't it? It's centred around zero, like that. It's only a little dude. If we're going to use that sort of maths to describe weights and stuff, we'll have to move this out to maybe have a mean out at one, well, well mean weights at stuff, I don't know, 65 kilos or something like that. But we can do it. Once we've found that little uh, distribution that gives the normal shape, the bell-shaped curve, we can play with it mathematically. That's beyond this course, but it's how we get into being able to calculate probabilities. So let's have a look, first of all, at uh, summing up some situations where you reckon in the real world that you would have created a, uh, a normal distribution. If you took a whole population, you know, many, many, so it's a smooth curve, not just separate, um, or not just um, histogram columns, but uh, if you took a lot of 17-year-old girls, why do you think they might produce a normal distribution around a height of, I don't know, what do you reckon, 145 centimetres? Why would it be that way? Well, let's see if we can find three factors that give you random variation. Now, I want you to try these other ones as well. 
But if you get those factors that are varying randomly, then you're going to create an overall random distribution for that variable. Okay, and then I'd like you to think about and discuss in the class these other two questions. It's all getting your head around saying, why are we doing this? Why have mathematicians bothered so much with a normal distribution? Okay, let's go on now and answer that question about what we've done. So here are some answers from Hayes again uh, for you to look at, and you could discuss question two and three as well. All right, so what? Let's go down. Here we have it. Once you let a mathematician loose on a normal distribution, all things are going to happen, all sorts of things. And I said, draw that on your calculator to get the simplest one, and then mathematicians can play with this to adjust the means to different values. This one has a mean of naught, and you'd like to create a function, I think, with any mean, call it mu. And if you do, uh, we could change this. The probability of the variable x is 1 over sigma root 2 pi e to the nega half x minus mu on sigma squared. OK, now this function, you don't have to know all this math. I'm just giving it to you for a matter of interest. Because all normal distributions like this follow this formula. The sigma gives you the spread or the standard deviation, how spread the uh, scores are on the average away from the mean. And then this is the mean itself, isn't it? So when they are plotted, they all have a common set of properties. The mean's always in the middle, a perfect the symmetrical distribution and the median and the mode all line up there as well due to the symmetry. And then, when you move one standard deviation to either side, you get this little inflection here. It's called a point of inflection. It's when you draw, draw a smooth curve, you have to change from your pen going down to slightly coming up again. You can't actually see that point. But in that situation, in any normal distribution, if you work out a standard deviation and work one standard deviation either side, then you get a common effect, 68% of all scores live in there. And then if you go out to two, two standard deviations either side of the mean, see that's there and there, then that will contain approximately 95% of all scores. You might say, well, how do you know that? Well, because all normal distributions are, can be described mathematically by this, where the height up here is the probability of getting that particular score. OK, and if you go out to three standard deviations lower and three standard deviations higher, in that set of scores, and that range of scores, contains approximately 99.7% of all scores. Now these are approximate figures, approximately, but it's handy. We're going to see how it's handy in a minute. Once you detect a variable, like heights or weights of people that are following a, a normal curve, and you can work out their mean and standard deviation, estimated by good sampling, then you can work out the chances of getting somebody very, very tall, or very, very short, etc. It's a handy tool. I think you can see that. Let's go down and see how that works now. Now, just get rid of that and have a look here. Let's have a look at a problem from Hayes and Harris now. Now here we're saying the mean of a variable x that is normally distributed is 40. Well, what could that be? Could be 40 mils in a small drink or something, or 40 grams in a packets, and the standard deviation is 5. So what we would have had to do there is maybe take many, many packets like this, 100, 200, 300, work out those values which we've learned to do already, and if we did a little histogram, we might see, oh, yes, it looks like it's normally distributed. And uh, for this particular variable, which could be a weight or a volume, we see, yes, we estimate that it will be normally distributed. We can't do the whole population. Take too long, too expensive, and other reasons as well. But we could work out the chance that it's less than 45 or lies between 30 and 45. Why? Mass to the res rescue. 
Okay, and the idea is if we draw this normal distribution with a mean of 40 and then we go up 5, that's 45 on either side, 5 on either side, 45 and 35, there's 68% in there. Then if we go up another standard deviation, 50 and down to 30, then that's got uh, the next uh, percentage, which is a 95% be between those two, and so on. So let's have a look at less than 45. Where is 45? Well, 45 is here. So less than 45 is all this, 50% are below the mean, plus this 34 will be 84%. So you've got to juggle around all these percentages, which we've worked out as mathematicians because we know the common formula for normal distributions. That's not in this course, but I want you to see how the tool has arisen. What about between 30 and 45? It's getting a bit crowded in here, so I'll just uh, scrub some of this out now. Between 30 and 45. Let's use the properties here. So it's down to 30, up to 45. So we can add all these up and get 81.5%. We know those cutoffs because every normal distribution has the same connection between those percentages and their individual mean and standard deviations. Okay, let's have a go at uh, trying to use this now. Now the crucial thing here, I think the steps that you must follow is number one, draw a normal distribution curve. All right, number two, mark in uh, the standard deviations above and below with the scores matching those. And then you can work out the regions you want to use work out the percentage in the regions you want to use. All right? But you must start with going like this, the mean, one standard deviation, work out as a number, another standard deviation, etc. Okay, so then you can answer these questions. Now in this example, they have chosen scores which lie exactly one or two or three standard deviations above the mean. So it's a bit artificial. Okay, it's an approximate way, it's very handy, but we can't actually at this stage work out uh, what percentage if it was between standard deviations. Okay, so have a go at question one, and you can fast forward and check the answers, but I'm going to get you to pause and have a go, then I'm going to bring up question two. All right, let's go down to question two now. Sorry about that. Let's go down to question two. There's question two. I want you to do the same thing. They've started with a curve for you, so you've just got to add those standard deviations. So add on a standard deviation and put the number there. Okay, pause it, have a go. I'm going to go to question three and four. I think, can we get in? No, we just get three and four. So again, you need to draw a diagram, mark in the standard deviation, work out what percentages you need to use. So you have to look back at that original breakdown for a standard deviation, for a normal curve. Okay, come down to question five. There's question five. We'll go to question six. We've got six, seven. I don't know whether we can get eight on there. Now we can go six and seven. Okay, let's bring up eight. There's eight. And now I'm going to show you the answers and you can mark your work. So have a look now at the answers here. There's five N from the textbook. There's question one to eight. Now, of course, I think you would be fairly critical, wouldn't you? You say, honey, hey, you kept saying it's approximately. Shouldn't you be able to work it out exactly? And shouldn't you be able to work it out when it's not an exact standard deviation away from the mean? And the answer is yes. And of course, we're going to use technology for that because on board the calculator, the calculator, we have put the mathematical formula for the normal distribution. And if we tell the calculator the mean, that's always in the middle, 
And you can see here, the standard deviation, that's what that's mu plus one standard deviation. So the standard deviation is three. So now we could say, all right, that's approximately 34%. We're gonna to go to the calculator and get it to calculate it perfectly in a minute. But we couldn't do this, could we? Because 11 isn't um, a standard deviation above the mean. A standard deviation above the mean would be 10 plus three, would be 13, somewhere there. That'd be all right if it was an exact standard deviation above, but it's not. So this breakdown principle, this rough dissection of the normal distribution, won't allow us to do this problem. And that is, what's the probability of getting a value between eight and 11? Because 11 is not an exact number of standard deviations above the mean. All right, so it's technology to the rescue. Let's go and do it. And here we are, I've taken screen clippings from uh, Hayes and Harris Publications. And this is for the Casio 9860. So you collect, connect stat mode. And then uh, distribution, which is F5, F1 normal, and then F2 NCD. And you get this window here. Okay, so you put in the lower and the upper and so on. Let's go down. And with that window, we're going to put in 8 for the lower, 11 for the upper, 2, notice they put in, they asked for the standard deviation first, and then the mean, and then 10 for the mean. So you'd have this window, lower, upper, standard deviation first, not mean, and deviation, and then the mean. And then you're going to execute that in a minute. Here we are. Execute that, and the window, this highlights down the bottom, and then you can go again, and there on the next window is the uh, probability. You don't at this stage have to worry about z-scores in this course. This is a very elementary introduction to the normal distribution for mass applications. So you can see here the probability of getting scores on a normal distribution between eight and 11, if the mean is 10, standard deviation is two, is 53.3% to three significant figures. Just notice, probabilities can be wor worked out or written as a fraction, um, as a rational number, in other words, ratio of integers, or a decimal fraction like that, or you could change it to a per percentage, which is times E1 by one, which is uh, by 100, sorry, which would be 53.3%. And we usually do use, in these courses, three significant figures. All right, do you think you can do it? Well, come and have a look, and let's do uh, a problem. Again, one from Hayes and Harris Publications. Length of salmon caught in South Australian waters is normally distributed. You'd expect that with all the factors affecting the growth of fish, you would expect random variation. Remember, that random variation gives rise to the symmetrical distribution, equally likely to be above or below. And we've done some sampling and we reckon the mean is about 41.4, standard deviation 4.2. So we took 500 maybe and put them on our calculator or on a spreadsheet and we worked out that was the mean and the standard deviation. And when we graphed it, it looked a pretty normal distribution. So now let's extend what we've done to, to answer this. What percentage of a large catch would be expected to have a length of between 38 and 44. This is, we'd have to say here, a large catch taken at random, not from a particular spot where we knew the fish were longer or something. So it's a random one. And uh, a large catch suggests that, uh, which a good sample would be normally distributed, okay, uh, in that smooth curve fashion. Okay, between 38 and 44. Let's do that. So X is the length of a salmon, and they've used the TI here, doesn't matter. We want it between 38 and 44. No, notice there the inequality statements here. That's a nice way of doing it. We read this as 38 is less than X is less than 44. Okay, and then the Casio, of course, is um, NCD as we did it before lower, upper, uh, sigma, 
and mu, putting in the same numbers, so this is lower, upper, uh, and here, they put it in a different order, that's mu and that's sigma on the 90, uh, ti, sorry. Okay, so when you do that, you get a, approximately 0.523, about 52.3% of the catch. So that might be important if you're shipping overseas. And they say, oh, we want some big ones. Uh, we want them at least 38, but we don't want them more than 44. It's too big on the plate. About how, what, what would your estimate be of your shipment that you're sending us? Well, we say about half of them. Okay, so it gives people a good idea. What about more than 43? Ooh, X is greater than 43. Well, let's look at it. The lower would be 43. The upper, uh-oh, there's no limit. So let's look on our distribution here. We've got a mean standard deviation. We want bigger than 43. But this goes on forever, theoretically. And that's not in practice, is it? You can't get an infinitely long fish. But for the purposes of our model, our mathematical description, we want to take it as far this way as possible. So we on the calculator put E99. Now in the Casio, E is in the bottom row, uh, exponential button, exponential 99. So you find it down there, and then you can put your sigma 4.2 and the mean of 41.4. So it's really saying we'll extend this mathematical model right the way out to make sure we get our best estimate of all the fish bigger than 41.4. Um, and that's about a third of them. Okay. So uh, this little dude here, she's saying E99 is the largest number that can be entered on the calculator. It's in the bottom row, uh, exp, we actually put exp99. Okay which is uh, raising e to the 99 for like. All right, what about less than 35? Okay, well this time we want a, an in, undetermined lower value. We know the upper value is, well there's mu of 41.4. We want less than 35, but there's no restriction going this way. We want the smallest possible value. So the lower value we put negative E99. Meaning we've covered all possibilities. Infinitely small number in that direction. And then the upper, we want it less than 35. So that'll be 35. And the sigma here, different from the TI, put the sigma first and then the mu, then the mean. Okay. So the probability that X is less than 35 is about uh, 6%. So what they're worried about there is, let's say they're running a restaurant. They're saying, well, we don't want any short fish. People like uh, King George Whiting to be uh, really big fish, so characteristic of that. They have that characteristic. Uh, we don't want anything less than 35. It's too small. Might look like a different fish, butterfish or something. Okay. So you can say, well, uh, we, we estimate only about 6%. 6% would be less than that, and see if they are happy with that. All right, let's go down and see if you can do some now. You can see the power of this. Again, partially to do with quality control and just estimating what you're likely to find in your group. Okay, so here we are. I would suggest you follow the steps carefully. Draw distribution with a mean sound deviation. In this case, these numbers will not be an exact standard deviation away from the mean. So you will need the graphics display calculator. Okay, and now we're going to have pretty accurate estimates. Okay, and you use, when you finish the whole problem, round it off to three significant figures. All right, are you ready? There's the first four. Pause the presentation and uh, we'll come back. I'll show you the rest of the problems and you can forward on and check your answers. Okay, going on now, let's go to question five. Uh, four and five there, and um, pause it, have a go. And now we're going down to the answers now. So here's your answers. How did you go? Can you see the power of this? It's very important if you can achieve or determine that the things that you're making 
or, S or um, de describing, uh, normally distributed, you've got a lot of mathematics power uh, behind that with that normal distribution curve and the graphics display calculator. Well, I hope you're proud of that and uh, keep thinking about it. Um, it's a powerful tool. Well, this is the end of the presentations for statistics in maths applications, but coming up next will be some work with networks. So uh, hope to see you then. Cheers for now.